Hello, everyone, and welcome to this presentation on BA2 in association with SEMA Island. Uh, my name is Peter Steff. I'm the uh, strategic case study manager and the head of business development at Astranti Financial Training, as well as one of the lead tutors. Been uh, tutoring at SEMA for many years now. And uh, hopefully this particular presentation is really going to help you out with some of the tricky topics for BA2. And the ones that I've picked out are not only ones that we often uh, hear from students as uh, being difficult topics, but they're also topics that you're not just going to need for certificate level. These are topics that are built on and built on as you progress through your SEMA studies. So it's actually really in your best interest to uh, learn about these topics at this stage because they are going to be there throughout. So we're going to look at three main topics today and uh, we're going to look at relevant costs and revenues. We're going to look at investment appraisal and also variance analysis. And what I'm going to do is go through a short presentation for each topic. And then I'm going to go through a question, a sample question, and how you would break it down, how you would arrive at the correct answer. So we'll start by looking at relevant costs and revenues. And this all ultimately relates to costs and decision making, which of course, as a management accountant is incredibly important. You have to make decisions every day as a part of your job. And it's also relevant for investment decisions. So it also does tie in with the other things that we're going to look at today when we're looking at investment appraisal. So what are the kinds of decisions that you'll have to make as a management accountant on a daily basis or within an organization? Well, there could be certain products that you have to produce. You've got several different products and you don't know which ones you are going to produce at your company. So you might have to decide which ones to make or not, which resources you need, which assets you need to purchase, staffing. Do you have too many staff? Do you have not enough staff, etc.? All of these things are important decisions that have to be made and they're affected by lots of different things, such as what your competitors are doing, what your overarching strategy is. If your strategy is to grow, then you need to perhaps invest early on. So even if it's going to cost you more to buy, uh, to hire those new stuff, it's going to cost you more to buy those new assets, etc. may not be good in the short run, but your overall strategy is to grow. So it does have an impact. What the markets are doing as well, and the profitability of the various different products that you're looking at. And so analyzing re revenues and costs and making sure you are picking out and identifying and analyzing the relevant revenues and costs is very important for management accounting. So for example, if you were looking at these particular decisions, you'd be thinking about whether or not the products can be sold profitably, whether the revenues are going to be enough to cover the costs, whether things are going to be affordable in the long term, and also your current production rates. Do you need to hire more staff if you are not producing quickly enough? And that all sounds quite straightforward, but where it gets a bit complicated is analyzing what is truly a relevant cost and what is not, because it's quite different from traditional accounting, which would say that any cost was relevant, all costs have to be paid for, et cetera. So let's take a look at some relevant costs and how they are used to support decision making. And a definition of relevant costs and revenues is any cost, any revenue that is directly impacted by a decision or directly impacts upon a decision. So what we're looking at here is for future cash flows, future incremental costs, et cetera things that will only arise as a result of taking a decision or not, rather than traditional costs, which are always accumulated, always accounted for. I'll give you a couple of simple examples to explain this. And let's say that we've sold our car 
and we want to purchase a new car and we have two options. So we can purchase the car A, it's going to cost us $4,000 and then $1,000 a year for the next three years. Or we can purchase the car B, which costs $5,000. Now, what are the relevant costs here? Now, the car B is more expensive initially, costs $5,000 compared to $4,000 with the car A. But the car A, on the other hand, has got $1,000 per year every single year or for three years afterwards. So these are the relevant costs. The initial cost is relevant, but also the future costs are relevant because it actually means that car A costs more in total compared with car B. So both the initial cost and the future costs are relevant in this decision here. What about the $3,000 that we made from already selling our car? Is that relevant? No, because we've already sold the car. We've already generated that $3,000. does not impact upon our decision to select car A or car B. So therefore, we exclude the $3,000 from the decision-making process because it's not relevant to the outcome of the decision. Then on to the second example. And let's imagine that we are producing a housing project. And we've invested 110 million pounds into this housing project already. And we need another 100 million pounds to complete it. And once we've completed it, we can sell it for 150 million pounds. Now you might be looking at that and thinking that's a terrible investment because the total cost to complete this project is 210 million and we're only going to sell it for 150 million. But again, that's including all costs. When we're looking for the irrelevant costs, when we're answering the question, should it be completed? Because what we need to think here is that 110 million has already been invested. So are we going to get that 110 million back if we don't complete the project? No, it's gone. It's already been spent. Therefore, it should not factor in our decision-making process because the money is not going to come back regardless. So instead, all we focus on is the future costs and the future revenues. So as far as we're concerned, we're spending 100 million pounds to make 150 million. We don't consider that 110 million at all. Yes, and so yes, we should complete it because it's 100 million spent for 150 million in revenue. And if we don't complete it, we don't spend that extra 100 million, but we don't receive that 150 million, but we still have already spent that 110 million. So it doesn't actually impact the decision either way. And so essentially this is where the sometimes the conflict between relevant costs and financial accounting does come into play because you would have to consider that 110 million in traditional accounting. And so relevant costing can ignore certain costs. And I'll give you an example to finish off of the types of things that would be considered relevant costs. It would be future cash flows. So revenue generated from a new project that you obviously won't generate if you don't undertake it. That is a relevant cost. Also incremental costs and revenues. So if you uh, perhaps undertake a new project that fits in with your existing project and any additional costs that you have to incur to uh, fulfill the, the new requirements of it will be relevant. Also opportunity costs. So that's money that you could have generated by taking another offer or another opportunity. So if you've got project A, project B, a relevant cost when deciding is how much money you will lose by not taking option B when you're looking at the cost of option A. And avoidable costs is uh, costs that you won't have to pay if you don't undertake the project. So any additional cost that you will no longer have to undertake if you don't take the project is a relevant cost in the decision-making process. Whereas non-relevant costs are things like sunk costs. Sunk cost is money that's already been spent. So that would be the housing example, the 110 million that had already been spent. That is a sunk cost. It is not 
going to be reclaimed in any way. Committed costs are costs that, whilst they are, have not actually been accumulated yet, they are already going to happen. You're committed to paying them. So an example of this could be rent on a factory. You've already got this factory, you're committed to paying rent for it for five years. You haven't actually paid the rent that's gonna be next year, the year after yet, but it's committed, it will happen. Allocated costs are costs that are generally paid for by certain departments to uh, business functions, such as the human resources function to the financial function, etc. And it's not actually directly related to operations, it's just an apportion that's paid. So that is excluded and non-cash expenses as well. So this will be more accounting adjustments, things like depreciation, amortization. That's just a pure accounting adjustment. It's not considered a relevant cost for the purposes of decision-making. So that's a brief introduction into relevant costs. What we're now going to do is take a look at a relevant costing question. And this is very similar to the type of question you might face in your exam. And the question says, a catering firm has been offered a contract to, uh, to provide catering for a large scale corporate event, which three of the following are not relevant costs. So remember that word not relevant cost to the catering firm when considering whether or not to accept the uh, contract. So what we need to do here is read through the different options and identify whether they are relevant costs or non-relevant costs. And hopefully there will be three non-relevant costs that we identify. And that makes, means we'll be able to answer the question effectively. So the first one, option A, is it the cost of hiring additional waiters on temporary contracts to work for the event? So waiters that we have to hire in order to complete this project, in order to go ahead with hosting this event. Well, this will be an incremental cost. So just write that down. Apologies for my handwriting. An incremental cost is a relevant cost because it's costs that will not be accumulated if we do not undertake the cost that will not be accumulated if we do not undertake the project. And therefore, it's relevant to the decision making process. What about option B? Option B at the 10 year lease on the main catering facility, which will be used to prepare food for the event. So this is a catering facility that we already have. It's something that we prepare food for, for lots of different events. And we've already signed a 10 year lease for it. So it has absolutely no bearing whatsoever on this particular event. So this is a non-relevant cost. It's a committed cost that we have already committed to pay for. So that is our first answer. Answer B, that is a non-relevant cost. Next one, option C, surplus ingredients left over from a different event, which if we don't use for this contract will be disposed of. So some food, drinks, etc., that we already have that we could use for this event, but if we don't use them, we'll throw them out. So again, is this relevant or not? And I want you to think back to the housing project here. This, this is the 110 million. This is the ingredients, the food, the drink, that has already been paid for. We might use it for this event, we might not use it for the event, but the important thing is it's already been purchased, it's already been paid for. So again, it is non-relevant. 
So that is also a correct answer. And then option D, the depreciation on the catering equipment and delivery of vehicles. And as I mentioned in that section, we'll be going through it. This is a, an accounting adjustment. So that's also automatically non-relevant. So those are our three options. And we'll just confirm that by checking E, the total revenue that could be generated from catering a different event. So that's an opportunity cost. It's the money that we could have made from catering another event. And that has to be factored into the decision making process. So those are the three relevant costs when uh, we are, of the three non-relevant costs when we are analyzing this project. The other two, so uh, that is uh, option A and option E, these are relevant and they would need to be considered. So that's relevant costing. That's an example of a relevant costing question. We're going to move on now to the next presentation, which is on investment appraisal. And investment appraisal is another topic that students often struggle with, but it's, it's one that's gonna be really, really important throughout your studies. And uh, the most important investment appraisal techniques for the SEMA syllabus is net present value. And net present value is uh, all about looking at how much future value, future revenue, future costs, et cetera, are worth today. And as it can go up or it can go down, but you want to uh, appraise the investment in advance to see whether it's actually adding value to you as an organization. And this is a process known as discounting to account for the time value of money and also to account for the returns required by shareholders, which I'll explain a bit more in a moment. But I'll give you a very, very simple example to start with. If you put 100 pounds in the bank today and there is 5% interest in one year's time, you will have 105 pounds because of the interest. So but what if you are looking at that 105 pounds in a year, or you're looking backwards thinking, how much would 105 pounds be worth to you here and now? Well, let's say that your neighbor gives you 105 pounds in a year's time to say, I'm gonna give you 105 pounds next year. How much is that worth to you now when current interest rates are 5%? Well, you work backwards by dividing it by uh, the, the 1.05 interest to give you your discount factor, which is 0 0.952. And if you multiply uh, the discount factor by uh, the uh, money that you're going to receive in one year's time, it will get you 100 pounds, which is what it's worth to you today. And this is really important to, to do because shareholders require a certain amount of return. And uh, what a net present value does is it shows that whether something is going to be profitable or not, or is going to add value once the shareholder's return has been taken into account. Because if a project is not discounted, then it's generally always going to be positive. But if it ultimately only actually provides 3% return and shareholders require 10% return, it's not providing a return greater than what is already expected by shareholders and therefore it's not adding value. So take a look at how uh, a net present value is uh, drawn up, how it is calculated. And this is just a, a brief diagram of what it would look like. And you have the various different costs and uh, receipts on one side and you have the various different years. And uh, what is important, the most important bit on a net present value is the discount factors that are added in here because that is going to discount the net cash flow to give you the present value for each year and the discount factor will increase year on year because if you are requiring a 12 percent return then year one will have to be a 12 percent return year two will have to be 12 percent by 12 percent because you have to get a 12 percent return year on year and so on. And just as a, an overview of, uh, it will look a lot more clear when I go through an example, uh, just as 
an overview for what happens with the timing of the cash flows, because this is something that students sometimes do struggle with, is that the cash outflows that occur at the start of the project always come in year zero. So if you have to purchase an asset, a factory for a project, any financial outlay at the start of the project is just automatically in year zero. And it's important that it's put in year zero because it is not discounted. You do not discount the cash that you're expending right now because it is the present. You're not discounting it by next year's cash flow. And any cash outflows or inflows within a particular year are treated as if they occurred at the end of the year. So the money made on the first day of the project beginning or the second day once the machines have been purchased will go in year one. The money generated at the very end of the year will go into year one. It's just a total of all the cash inflows and outflows that were generated during the first year. I'll give you an example of what a net present value looks like. This is a very basic NPV where there is a cost of capital of 12%. So this is the return required by shareholders of 12%. And let's say that we purchase land and buildings in uh, year zero, of course, that's at the start of the, uh, at the very start, as well as fixtures and equipment of 910,000. And the revenue that we plan to generate over the next four years are written out as such. So in year one, we're going to generate £2,340,000. In year four, £3,900,000. So of course, we need to add in the discount factor. So the first thing we do is calculate the total net cash flow. So that's the summary of all the inflows and outflows throughout the year. So for year zero, that's 5135000 And there are no other inflows or outflows in the other years. Of course, usually we have costs on an annual basis, etc. But this is just for demonstration purposes. The next thing you do is add in your discount factor. And the discount factor is 12%. And if you want to calculate this manually, it's you can calculate it by, I think the formula is 1 divided by 1 plus r to the power of n the N being the number of periods, the R being the discount rate, which would be 12. But that's a very complicated way of doing it. The best thing to do is use the present value tables. The present value tables will be given in your SEMA exam. All you need to do is look for the particular percentage along the top. In this case, it would be 12%. And then look at the different periods, which will be uh, down the left-hand side. And if we look at the present value tables, the discount factor for year one is at 0 0.893, for year two is 0 0.797, and so on. And the whole purpose of this is to discount that cash flow, taking into account a 12% return. So if the net present value is still positive after we've taken in this 12% return required by shareholders, then it's something the company should do. It's adding value to the organization. And then to calculate the present value, we multiply the net cash flow by the discount factor, which gives us for year one, 2 million and 90,000, for year two, 2 million 590,000 and so on. And then to calculate the net present value, we simply add up all the uh, different present values. So including the initial cash outflow for the purchasing of the uh, land and buildings and the uh, fittings and equipment. And that is the total of 4,617,000. So even when the 12% discount is factored in, the present value of this project right here, right now, the present value we add to the organization by undertaking this project is at four million six hundred and seventeen thousand pounds. So that's an introduction into uh, net present value and to investment appraisal in general. There are other investment appraisal 
that you will need to use it for your exam, such as internal rate of return and payback periods. But net present value, I've highlighted that as a specific one to go through here because it's just so important to your STEAM exams. You will need to know net present value for management level, for the management case study. You'll need to know about net present values for the strategic case study because you might be given reference material in your strategic case study exam relating to net present value. So it's a very, very important thing to know. And particularly this whole idea that it's, it's a return above required by shareholders. That's a, a really core concept to uh, know about net present values. So let's take a look at a question relating to uh, net present values. And again, the kind of question you, you might face in your exam. So we can see we've got uh, a question here. The management accountant at company X has provided the following figures for project Y. So we've got our initial investment of 600,000 pounds, year one revenue of 300,000, increasing to 350,000 in year two and 500,000 in year three. There's also annual running costs of 100,000 pounds and the cost of capital is 7%. So remember, we need to use the present value tables. And just as I mentioned earlier, you can actually calculate it yourself by uh, one divided by one plus R to the power of N, N being the periods and R being the rate. So if you wanted to calculate the actual discount factor to use for year one, it would just be one divided by one plus 0 0.7, 0 0.07. If you were looking for year two, it would be one divided by one plus 0 0.07 to the power of two and so on. But it's better to use the present value tables because they always they already do the rounding up to three decimal places. And that's what SEMA themselves suggest to use. It's just giving you that information just to let you know if you can't find the present value tables that you can calculate it yourself. And the question is asking us, what is the net present value for project Y? So we need to calculate the net present value and always make sure it asks you for the net present value before you start answering it. Because it's very easy for students to look at this sort of question here and just assume it's a net present value question. But sometimes there might be very specific requirements saying what's the present value of year two or what's the tax for year three, et cetera, if you were given more information about tax. So to calculate the net present value, we need to start by calculating our discount factors, which again we'll use the present value tables for. So in year one, given that it's 7% cost of capital, the discount factor is zero, 0.935. In year two, it is 0 0.873. And in year three, it is 0 0.816. So these are the discount factors that we'll need to apply to each year. Now we need to calculate the cash flow for each year. we've been given the revenue for each year. We've also been given this part here about the annual running costs being at 100,000. So we have to deduct that from each year to get our net cash flow. So in year one, that will be 200,000 because that is 300,000 minus 100,000, as I'm sure you know. Then for year two, that will be 250,000. 350,000 minus 100,000. And in year four, 400,000. 500,000 minus 100,000. And these need to be multiplied now by our discount factors. So year one, we need to be multiplied by 0 0.935. 
and that is equal to 187,000 pounds. Repeat the process for year two, and that is 218,250 pounds. And finally, for year three, multiplying by 0 0.816, that is 326,400 pounds. We also need to deduct the initial investment, the year zero initial investment of 600,000 pounds to see whether the project is uh, actually has a positive net present value or not. So we need to add these together and then also add our initial investment of £600,000 in. Total that up and we get the net present value, which is equal to £131,650, which we can see is option D in our list of options. So that is the correct answer. That's the net present value. And now we calculate the net present value using uh, those uh, figures uh, that we've been given here. So again, that's uh, another good example of uh, a type of investment appraisal question you uh, may face in uh, your exam. And we're gonna move on to the final topic now, uh, which is slightly longer than the other two and a bit more complicated. And after that, we'll have a short Q&A session. So we're going to move on to variance analysis. And variance analysis is a topic that scares a lot of students. It's quite a difficult thing. It's quite an obscure thing, but it's actually quite straightforward when you really understand the base concept of it, and you learn the various different variance analysis techniques and the, the calculations and the steps required. So we'll start by a brief introduction into it. Variance analysis is all about looking at the difference between a standard cost and actual cost. And standard cost is generally your budgeted cost. And it's your budget that is created based on a set standard for how much something should cost or labor should cost, etc. Now, in the real world, sometimes you buy materials and they might cost £3.67, and sometimes it might cost £4.22. It's quite difficult to say that they're always going to be a set price, but the standard is a fair average of what it should cost. So you might average that as saying £4.00, per unit, because that makes it much easier to budget. If you have a standard cost of you know, each material or each unit we produce uses 10 kilograms of material and the material costs four pounds per kilogram. And then the actual cost is how much you actually spent on materials, how much you actually spent on labor. And it's an important part of variance analysis to identify and calculate the variance, but also understand why a variance happened. Because when you understand why a variance happened, you are able to correct it. You have to see, oh, we spent too much because we uh, were wasting material or because we were overpaying for our material. Those are two different things that can both lead to an adverse variance. And so in this next section, we're going to look at how you identify the different variances and also how you break them down to find the cause of the variance by examining both the price and the quantity, because these are two things that can affect the, uh, the total. But of course, if you just assume it's a price variance when actually it's a quantity variance, you're only going to increase the uh, variance by taking the wrong action. And uh, a couple of terms to uh, be familiar with. If you have a favorable variance, this is where the actual cost was at less than the standard cost. We actually spent less than we were supposed to. And an adverse variance is the opposite. So that's where the, the actual cost was higher than the standard cost. You didn't complete the project. You didn't spend what you were supposed to spend. You overspent. So let's look at an example. And again, imagine we're a management accountant 
And we are needing to calculate the direct material variance, the labor variance, and the overhead variance for the company that we work for. We've got some information uh, relating uh, to uh, what we're going to uh, base this, what we're going to base our variances on. And uh, we've got the inputs for the standard cost. So per unit we produce, we've got our direct material. We're supposed to use 17 kilograms of uh, material at a cost of five pounds per kilogram, gives a total of 85 pounds per unit. For labor, we use 30 hours of labor per unit and our labor costs three pounds per hour, giving us a total cost per unit of 90 pounds. And for variable overheads, again, 30 hours, but it's only two pounds an hour, giving us a cost of uh, 60 pounds per unit. So these are our standard costs. These are what it should cost us to produce a unit. The time it should take us, the quantity we should use, and the costs that we should incur. And then we have our actual costs here. So 6,600 kilograms was used at a cost of 34,320 pounds. And 11,520 hours was used. And that's the relevant figure for labor and uh, variable overheads. And that the costs are 32,256 for labor and 24,422 for variable overheads. And we don't need to look at the fixed production overheads because we have not been asked to calculate the fixed overhead variance. And we also don't need to worry about the selling price here because we have not been asked to calculate the sales variance. So what we need to do now is basically look at how much it has cost us to produce 400 units, because that's what we actually produce. We don't worry about the budgeted production. We're just looking at what 400 units should have cost us based on our standard costs compared to what it actually did cost us to see whether we have been efficient or not in our production. And we're gonna start with direct material variances. The first step is always to calculate the cost variance. This is the, the pure basic variance. Did we spend more money than we were supposed to or not? Remember that we're doing it at the actual output, so at 400 units. So how much should 400 units have cost us? Well, we can see that we, to produce 400 units, we need 17 kilograms of material per unit. So uh, if we look at the total cost of what 17 kilograms of material should cost us, we use five kilogram, that's five pounds per kilogram, it should have been 85 pounds per unit. So if we multiply 85 by 400, that gives us the standard cost of our material, which is 34,000 pounds. However, we can also see that our actual material cost was 34,320 pounds, leading to an adverse cost variance of 320 pounds. We spent more than 400 units should have cost us to produce. But was this due to paying a different price for the materials or was it because we were using more material? We perhaps used 18 kilograms for some of the units, for example. Well, what we can do now is break it down into the price variance and the usage variance to identify whether it was because of the quantity or because of the price. Because as I mentioned earlier, it's important to identify the cause of the variance in order for it to be corrected. And to calculate the price variance, we can look at the quantity of material that we used and see what the standard cost for that amount of material should be. So we should be paying five pounds per kilogram and uh, we used 6,600 kilograms. So the price of that material should have been 33,000 pounds, but it was 34,320 pounds, meaning that's an adverse price variance of 1,320 pounds. So we overspent, it should have been less than what it actually cost us to procure that amount of material. 
So it was a higher price that was paid. And then we look at the usage. This is how efficiently we were using uh, the uh, materials. So at the standard kilograms per unit, so 17 kilograms per unit, that actually to produce 400 units should have used 6,800 kilograms. But we actually only used 6,600 kilograms. So we were more efficient with the material. We actually had a favorable variance of 200 kilograms, which we then multiply by the price per kilogram to get the actual cash value of that favorable variance, which is 1,000 pounds, 200 multiplied by five. So we have a favorable variance for the usage, material usage, of 1,000 pounds. So we were using our materials more efficiently. And we can just quickly reconcile these to check that it complies with the cost variance because the, the sum of the price variance and the usage variance should equal the cost variance, which it does. But what's important is we've now identified the reason why there was a cost variance for our material. We were paying too much for it. We were using it effectively, but we were paying too much for it. You just see that there are some uh, questions coming in. I'll, I'll ask the, uh, the question, I'll answer the questions at the end, uh, just, just so, because we've got a Q&A session coming up. Now to answer our labor cost variance. Now labor is all to do with, of course, the people that are being uh, used, within, uh, used within the organization to produce the product. And we repeat the process now, but this time looking for the labor costs. So we look at how many, how, how much it should have cost us to produce 400 units. And we can see that the direct labor should be 90 pounds per unit, and we produced 400. And uh, therefore, it should have cost us 36,000 pounds to produce 400 units but the actual cost was only 32,256, meaning that there is a massive favorable variance of 3,744. But again, was it because we were using less hours or that the rate that we were paying was different? Well, we'll start by calculating the rate and looking at how much we should have paid for 11,520 hours. So we've got three pounds per hour is our standard labor cost. Multiply that by 11,520. We get the standard cost of 34,560. And this is actually a favorable variance compared with our actual cost. Well, our actual cost is a favorable variance of 2,304 pounds. So this was either due to us paying a lower rate and using perhaps less skilled staff that don't command such a high salary, or it could have just been a poor estimate, which in itself can be a reason. If you've got a vastly different actual to standard, then it could be that the standard is a poor estimate. And we can compare this with the efficiency. So how long it should have taken us to produce 400 units. So it should take us 30 hours per unit. We produced 400. Therefore, it should have taken us 12,000 hours. Of course, it only took us 11,520, which is a favorable rate of 480 hours multiplied by the pounds per hour, the rate per hour that we pay. That's 1,440. And the reason for this could be that we'd be more efficient using higher skilled staff or, again, a poor estimate. Of course, these do uh, go against each other somewhat in that this means we're using high skilled staff. This means we're using low skilled staff. So perhaps it could just be that the labor is a poor estimate. And again, we can just reconcile that to check that the cost variance is correct. And finally, the uh, variable overheads. And I won't go through this in as much detail because it is the same process again. It's so looking at how much 400 units should have cost us at the, uh, the variable rate of uh, two or 60 pounds per unit. And uh, this is a, an adverse variance, it costs us 422 pounds more than it should have done. 
And if we break it down by the expenditure variance and the efficiency variance, you can see that actually we have been efficient. We've used uh, less hours than uh, it should have taken us, which of course we already knew because it's pegged to the, uh, the labor hours of 30 hours. But we paid a lot more for our variable overheads. So uh, if we are, as a management accountant, looking at this variance, what we can read from this is that we're, we're basically paying too much for our variable overheads. Perhaps look at ways in which we could reduce the cost of our variable overheads. And again, one more time, just reconciling that. It's always important to reconcile just to make sure that you've got the calculation uh, correct. And uh, so those are some uh, uh, variances. There are some other ones such as sales variance and fixed overhead variances, et cetera, but the actual process is quite similar for each of them. It's, it's more important that you, you understand why you would conduct variance analysis and what you can read from it. It's actually, it's not the cost variance is, is only the start. It's more the breaking down by the price and the usage that is at the important part. So the final thing before we uh, go to the Q&A section is uh, we're going to uh, have a go at answering a uh, question, again, very similar to the type of questions you might see in your exam. So uh, the standard costs for the product W are based on the budgeted sales volume of 1,400 units. For one unit of product W, 25 labor hours are required at a cost of $4 per labor hour. In the last quarter, the company sold 1,200 units. So we can already see that is a adverse variance in terms of the amount that sold. And in total, 33,750 labor hours were used at a cost of $128,250. And we've been given some options here. We've been asked to calculate the uh, direct labor rate variance and the direct labor efficiency variance. And we need to calculate the correct answer for each of them. And uh, as we just saw, the direct labor rate variance is the difference in the standard cost of actual hours, of, of actual hours of the labor and the actual cost of the actual hours of labor. So what I mean by this is that we produced and sold 1,250 units, but our standard cost is all based around 1,400 units. So what we need to do is calculate how much it should have cost us to produce 1,250 units. And uh, so what we could do here is look, first of all, at the total number of labor hours worked, which is 33,750. And uh, we know that the rate is $4 per hour. So we can start by calculating how much, what, uh, sorry, 33,750 hours should have cost us. So uh, we can just calculate that by multiplying that by the rate of four dollars and that comes to a hundred and thirty five thousand pounds so according to our uh, sorry, dollars so according to our standard cost thirty three thousand seven hundred and fifty hours should have cost us a hundred and thirty five thousand dollars but of course it didn't cost us that because it's a hundred and twenty eight thousand two hundred and fifty so uh, we can find the difference here by deducting uh, the uh, standard cost from uh, the actual cost. And uh, that leaves us with the direct labor rate variance of $6,750. And we'll just confirm, so that's actually this one. And because the labor rate variances are actually different for all of them, we know from here that the answer is C. And sometimes these little things will be thrown into the equation for you. It could be that you have uh, a particular question where direct labor efficiency variance is, uh, you have lots of very similar ones throughout, as in, uh, let's say it was $5,000 for each of them. 
So just calculating it to check that it was $5,000 wouldn't help. It's all about the rate labor variance. But given that this is for demonstration purposes, I will also just prove to you, so to speak, that the uh, adverse, there is an adverse 10,000 direct labor efficiency variance. And uh, the direct labor efficiency variance is the difference between the standard number of hours required and the actual number of hours that required. So basically how many hours should have been used to uh, produce 1,250 uh, 1, units. And we know that it takes 25 direct labor hours. So the first thing we can do is uh, multiply 25 by uh, the number of units to get the number of hours it should have taken us, which is 31,250. Now that is a, an adverse variance because uh, actually we used 33,750 when we should only have used 31,250. So we can work out the difference by uh, deducting 31,250. And that gives us an adverse variance of uh, 2,500 hours. And now we need to multiply that by the rate per labor hour to get the actual cash value of it, so to speak, which was $4. So $4 multiplied by 2,500 gives us our labor efficiency variance of, you guessed it, $10 thousand dollars and that is the adverse direct labor efficiency uh, variance so uh, that's again how you would uh, answer questions relating uh, to uh, direct labor rate variances and direct labor efficiency variances again if the question had been relating to materials we would actually follow the same process it's still the same process regardless of whether you are looking at materials or whether you are looking at labor. But again, it's important to break it down by uh, the, uh, the rate and efficiency because what we as management accountants would know from this particular question is that actually we're paying very well, or we're, we're keeping our costs down in terms of how much we're paying for labor, but we are just being really inefficient with our labor. And perhaps we need to train our staff more effectively so that they are producing at a quicker rate. So that brings us to the end of those three sections. I hope you have uh, enjoyed it. I hope you have uh, got a good idea now about uh, what, what variance analysis is, what net present value is, how to calculate it, what relevant costs are as well, because these are really important things for you to learn. They will serve you throughout your senior studies. We've just got a few minutes left. So uh, just going to take a look at the, uh, the questions that were asked. Uh, so uh, the how do we get the discount factor? Uh, so the discount factor is given for you in the, uh, the present value tables. So uh, if in your actual exam, there will be a tab in the Pearson Boost system that's called present value tables. And that will give you a, a big list of all the different costs of capitals, all of the uh, all of the the different numbers. Uh, what I would also say, as well as I already mentioned there, if you don't know if you don't know where they are, I mean, I would I would advise you not to do this because I think you should use the present value. The team expect you to use them, but you can use this formula here if you uh, want to to calculate it yourself. So for example, if I just uh, give it a demonstration here. So if we wanted to calculate the discount factor for year two, what we could do is do one divided by one plus 7% to the power of two. So that would be one plus 1.07 squared. And if we work that out on a calculator, it does come to when we round it up to 0.873. So that is how you can calculate it yourself. But you, you'll just be 
making work for yourself in that sense. The, I would always use the present value tables because they're just given for you in uh, the exam. So in short, that's where, where that has come from. Just get the questions back up on the screen. So determine the cost of capital. How do you know that seven is the real cost of capital? Well, the, the real cost of capital, it's, it's something that will just be given to you in the exam. You, the, the breakdown between real cost and nominal cost is usually something in P2. So where you're, it's where you're factoring in inflation. And uh, that's a bit beyond what you'll be expected to do at, at the BA2 level. So just, you'll just be given the cost of capital and that's the cost of capital you should be using in uh, your, your answers. Uh, for the, the you are you were not given um, actual paper to calculate uh, to calculate things on, as in you're not given a physical thing. Um, you you do have a scratch pad in the Pearson Booth system that allows you to write notes on, and you are also given a there is a an online calculator that you are given. Although a lot of people are actually taking their exams at home at the moment with the uh, the COVID nineteen. Um, and so if you do have your own paper, then it's, you might be able to use it. You need to double check with SEMA um, because basically it's just for the purposes of uh, making sure you're not cheating, so to speak. I'm sure you wouldn't be cheating, but you know, they, they've got to invigilate it somehow. So it could be that you, you have to keep your eyes on the screen because they monitor you through your webcam while you're taking the test. I'm glad that you found it uh, useful. Um, I, I do believe that there will be copies of it that are shared. I, I've, I've shared the actual presentations themselves with, uh, with Seymour Island and there should be links for you uh, to be able to use for, for those or there might be a copy of the recording that is, is given out. Uh, I would need to double check that. Um, I, glad that you found it useful. I like to think that there's some, some really good topic in here. And uh, also uh, we are gonna be putting some more SEMA webinars on for with SEMA Island. We've got ones for BA1, BA3 and BA4, uh, potentially some more for BA2 as well. And uh, someone's asked there about Astranti. So Astranti is a, a tuition company and uh, we have been working the SEMA, with SEMA exams for quite a while now. We've had about 50,000 plus students come through us in some way, shape or form. And uh, you know, we've, we've helped loads of those to pass their exam. Um, you know, I've taught thousands of students through the strategic case study alone. And uh, you know, they, they all speak very highly of our materials. And we frequently have people performing the best in the world as well. In the, the last year or two, we had several top 10 in the world students for the case study exam. We do have material for all of the exams as well, from certificate right through to the strategic case study. In fact, our certificate material is free. So if you do wish to access that material, then please do go to the Astranti website, www.astranti.com. Uh, we have uh, free study texts for each of the certificate papers. We also have a video series. So for each of the SEMA, certificate modules. We have over 10, or over 10, depending on the amount of chapters, some of them are a bit longer. We have between 10 and 20 hours of video for you to review and to watch uh, video tuition. Uh, we also have three mock exams for each of them and a series of practice kits where you have uh, 30 questions for each chapter within the study text with a range of easy comprehensive questions and harder exam style questions to, uh, to test your knowledge on. So if you would be interested in any of that material, um, you know, hundreds of pounds worth of material that's free, um, if you want for certificate level, please do sign up for that on the, uh, on the Astranti website. And yeah, we are going to be producing more of these. We're going to be doing a, a BA1, a BA3 and a BA4 webinar for SEMA Island and potentially some more webinars as well. So I think that was all the uh, actual questions. 
Um, thank you for the thank yous. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Uh, I've enjoyed it. I hope you have too. And I hope to uh, see you all again soon.